use that. Well, thank you. Um, I, we, fortunately, we've got lots of time to explore how to get there, because you set up the problem very, very clearly, and you had to go quickly through the, the last part. But I want to I wanna back up and ask you, when we talk about vocational education and training, and I, I love the, your point about changing the name does not change the system. It's like changing the org chart in an mm -hmm. organization yeah. rarely fixes the underlying problems. Uh, but what are the vocations that kids go into in Singapore and Switzerland or, and, or uh, other states? Because we, you know, I think many of us have vocational training. Oh, that's carpentry or plumbing or electricians. Let's, let's start with that, because I think some of that may be the key to thinking about how you raise the prestige of vocational training. Some of it, as you said, is standards, and, and the, but maybe we could start there. Two answers to your question, both answers from Singapore. If you read my chapter on Singapore in the book, what you will see is that the, Singapore, the, Sing the development of both education to some extent, and certainly the economy to a great extent, was, was, was driven by the plan set by the Economic Development Board. And they were, they were totally focused on economic development. Their idea was that they would develop education and training in Singapore to support the next stage of economic development. Right, so, so industrial answer, policy, The right? answer to your question, was, yes, was entirely a matter of industrial policy. So when they started out, they had nothing. And their idea was simply to attract companies looking for low-cost labor and, and, a, and, and a great port. Singapore has, as you know, a great port and yes, strategic indeed. location. So they, what they went after was, what, what, was getting enough people who could train the electricians and, and the concrete people and the plumbers to, to build the, the factory sheds that they would then lease out to these foreign companies. They, they then laddered their way up the economic development ladder and at each phase, because this is what Singapore is, asked themselves, how are we going to attract to Singapore the people who are, uh, will, uh, the, the talent that will be needed here to persuade worldwide companies that we can do the next right. higher value added thing? At each stage, they kicked out the lower value added companies they had brought in in the previous stage, right. and they brought in the higher value. When they got done with doing that, they said, oh, geez, we've attracted the top companies in the world. What's the next step? Well, the next step, obviously, is to make our own top companies yeah. in the world. And that's where Singapore is right now. And they wanted to be the regional center for telecommunications, for ship. It goes on and on. You know the so story. They, I so, think you need to speak a but, little louder. Is that what I'm hearing? Do people in the back can hear you? But it, no. Okay. no, okay. So in that case, in that case, it, 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 is, a, it is an economic development story, but it's very different from China until recently. Very different from China in, in, in the early stages because although they started by wanting to offer low cost, low skill labor, they did that because that's all they had, right? right? And they said to themselves, even from the beginning, they said to themselves, what we want to do is not make our country rich, we want to make our people rich. And they knew that the only way to do that was to build their skills. So, so but uh, you, had, you had another. Uh, 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 so I was asking what vocation people go into. So if you're saying though. So, but on the status point, here's, here's the, here is the status. They reached a point where they put the money into voc ed, then they put their money into university, then they put their money basically into the academic stream in the right. schools. And then they turned around and they realized, oh my God, vocational education has become the dead end. It was exactly what it is here in the United States. This was not that long ago. So then they said, we are, what we've now got is a formula for a totally unbalanced economy, right? Everybody wants to go to university. Everybody wants to run the company. Right. Everybody wants to be a professional. There's nobody to do the work. So they, they <laughs> it's Singapore. So the, the, the premier and deputy premier themselves basically drove a process 
in which they reconceived vocational education in Singapore. They took a whole variety of uh, what we would regard as pretty conventional vocational education programs. They basically threw them away. They, did, they built four brand new institutions. If you visit them, these are the vocational education high schools. If you visit them, you think you're in a modern university. This was their way of saying to Singaporean parents, this government thinks that the most important thing you can do is go into vocational education. And so so let, me, let me ask you just again on that, and then I'm going to come back on Singapore generally. But So now when you go to vocational education and training, these four beautiful places, mm -hmm. what if they're not the top jobs? Because that's exactly, what are those jobs? Are they so, advanced so, manufacturing? Okay, or are so, they? So here, here's what, here's, if you go, here's what you will see. First of all, the Singaporean system is a school-based system. So, for reasons we can talk about later. So if you walk into one of those university-looking places, on the first floor you'll see shops. You'll see coffee shops, grocery stores, it goes on and on. Yeah. They're all run by students. Huh. They're, they're actually run on a business plan. They have to make money. So business is a vocation. So, yes. So, what you, if you look more broadly, here's what you see. They wanted to have a culinary program. But it's Singapore. It's not the kind of culinary program you will typically see here. They went to Paul Bocuse in Paris, said, design us, design us a, a culinary program worthy of the finest chefs in France. Why? Because Singapore wanted to have hotels in Singapore that world-class travelers would want to go to, right? They wanted, Singapore was building a, a, it's one of the largest ports in the world. So they, 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 have, they, have a, they have an oil platform business there that is one of the world's largest. Singapore is a giant factor in the oil business, even though they don't have a drop of oil. So they partnered with the companies, in, the Singaporean companies, that build these giant oil platforms, and they built what amounts to an apprenticeship program, much of which is actually cited in the schools but it's been designed by the platform firm. They, they, have a, they have a big business of refurbishing old planes to completely redo the insides. Ireland's in that business. There are a number of other countries. They partnered with the Rolls-Royce Engine Company. So you walk into the place where they train these kids, which is in one of their schools. It's not in an aircraft right. facility. It's got a, it's, it's got a, it's got a, uh, a Boeing 737, not a MAX an old 737, right? And that's what the kids are working on. And, and Rolls-Royce took the engines apart and they cut them up so you can see the insides. They, in other words, they rebuilt them for teaching purposes. Right. But those kids are actually working on real Rolls-Royce engines. They're working on real Rolls-Royce airframes, the whole damn shooting match. So it's everything. It's, so it's, okay. it's, it's, it's cooking, it's, it's running a coffee shop, it's aircraft rebuilding, the whole bloody gamut. So although as you were talking about Singapore, I was thinking you're, you're describing industrial policy, and I'm thinking, yes, the United States doesn't have industrial policy, and then you're talking about right. you know, sort of setting different levels of economic development. We don't have, we don't have that either. Right. Uh, and of course, it's small, and, and so you're reinforcing a number of the reasons I think people say, oh yeah, well sure, that's Singapore or Switzerland. These are small countries, and they, they have very different traditions. But so I, instead of asking you sort of broadly how how can we do this here because Singapore is special, you've actually done it. I know where you you have designed a system for Maryland, mm -hmm. right? And I know we're going to hit here from uh, the former chancellor of the University of Maryland in the next panel, Brett Kirwan. But talk to us. Let, let's cut to the chase about how you we actually what would it look like here, and then we'll go back to sort of explore. Uh, some of the differences with other places, and some of, and elaborate more on what you say, think we need. Yeah, I, I actually tried to prefigure some of that, of course, in the end of my right my, my remarks earlier, and I think it, it's got it's got many parts and pieces to it. First of all, it, it, we would have Baltimore connect its career and technical education system, if you wish. Uh, very closely to the state economic development agencies 
and have business people in Maryland play a very important role in the design of the system, in the running of the system, in the setting the standards for the system, in providing opportunities for kids to acquire structured work experience. To go high school, community college, apprenticeship. Yes, on. yes. So all of, all of that. In order to do that, you would have to have a governance mechanism that does not now exist in Maryland, or for that matter, in hardly any other American states. And uh, the governance mechanism, uh, there are many variations on all of this that are possible, of course, but in the one that, that, that Britt and others and, and, and our team worked on, um, we, we had in mind a governance mechanism that built on uh, a, a, a body that already exists in Maryland. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's the governor's workforce panel. It's got very heavy representation by top business people uh, in many different lines of work of uh, business in, in Maryland. It also has, uh, it's basically run by the Department of Labor it, it's, it's, and, and workforce development. So it's, it's got the economic development perspective, the labor force perspective, and the employer perspective. You've got to speak loudly. Yes, the, the educators would have a role in that, certainly. But right now, um, the actors I've just been talking about are on the outside looking in. They would, in fact, have a, have a very important role. That's number, number one. Second, you would need to have, you, you, you are quite right, the United States, it's really interesting. The United States says volubly, year after year after year, industrial development, no. Go and talk to a governor. Well, and okay. you, will, you will discover pretty damn fast that it's hard to tell the difference between Republicans and Democrats. Republicans know that the, that their, the people who are going to go to vote are going to look at their state of economic development and their state. If it's going well, they'll, they will credit the governor. If it's going badly, they will blame him or her, whether that was fair or not. They have a big interest, and in, in, it's especially true in states like mine in Maine. They know that they can't be good in everything. And, and so many of them, I think, have a predisposition to think, yeah, it would be nice to be hands off and say, you know, we'll support anything and everything, and, 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 and we can't have an industrial policy. But in point of fact, in every state there are industries that, that form the backbone of that state's economy. And, and so it's, it becomes an, a, a, a technical and political matter to start figuring out how you can support those industries by creating research and development laboratories yes. in the universities. There's all, you know what this list is, right? One of the things on that list is building a very a capable workforce. It, it, that process has to get married to these other pieces. Okay. Right? So, so yes, so no industrial policy, but we have economic development strategies. You bet. That's and right. to have economic development strategies, then yes, you need to engage the employers. Mm -hmm. But here, let's... let's, well, it's, more let's than, it's, it's more than that. It, if it, the state has a choice to make, it's the same choice that Singapore had to make. Are the, are the, you can't have a system to produce very high levels of technical competence unless you have workplaces where kids can, can acquire that competence. So the only question is, where are those workplaces? Are they going to be in business? Or are they going to be in schools? Or are they going to be in a combination? The, the employers have to be a part of that decision. They have to put together the standards. So even if the places are in schools, the work, the design of the work and the training has to be in the hands of the employers largely, because if it isn't, they aren't going to trust the output. Right? Okay. So I don't care whether it ends up being a school-based system or a work employer-based system. The employers and, and the government have to drive it. Now, there's one other big question there, which is, do you really mean, Mark, what, do, what, what did you just say about government? Shouldn't just the employers drive it? My answer to that would be no. And, and, and this take just a second to explain this. but. There's an enormous difference among the states in the United States. There are many states in the United States which are in a low-skill equilibrium. That, the most important businesses in the states 
are businesses that would go out of business if they couldn't keep wages very low. They don't care about raising skills. In fact, they're worried about raising skills because if the state raises the skills, either their employers will ask for their employees will ask for more money, or they will go out of state. But, right? But those are the jobs that will get automated mostly. Yes, but by the time that happens, those kids are going to be in no, terrible agreed. shape because they have no skills. So if you go to the employers in low-skill equilibrium states and you say, what kind of training do you want? I want people who will show up in time, do what they're told, and be able to read and write at a low level. Thank you, I will take care of the rest. A high-skill equilibrium state is an entirely different thing, right? High-skill equilibrium state is selling high-value added products and services. They die if they don't get highly qualified people. They're willing to pay them a lot. It's a totally different way of thinking. So in a high-skill equilibrium state, you can go to employers and get pretty good answers about how to get an even better economy. In a low-skill equilibrium state, it's not worth getting out of bed. It's not going to happen. So even in Singapore, which is now among the most high-skill equilibrium places in the world, the, the, the Economic Development Board gets the advice of employers about what the standards ought to be, but it doesn't say, oh, okay, that's what we're going to do, because the, the government says our next big step is going to be going into this business in a big way. So I right? hear opposition, uh, so not opposition, obstacles to overcome, so role of the government and getting employers involved. But let me, let's, let me grasp the nettle that I hear mm -hmm. as someone who was in school at very elite institutions till I was 30. So I'm just gonna own mm -hmm. that right up front. And yeah. I, one of them was, I went to Princeton and I still live there and I'm a merit of professor. And as you are saying, employers involved, every fiber in my being is as liberal arts education. Princeton is the sort of absolute epitome of it. Princeton doesn't even want you to take an, well, you can take an economics course, but God forbid you should have pre-law or pre-business or pre-anything vocational, right? You're supposed to be studying ancient music or, or you know, things that will open your mind. And I'm well aware, because I have been the head of New America for seven years and I know that only 14% of Americans go to four-year residential colleges, a fact I tell people around the country, and people are shocked. But the problem, it's not so, okay, it's not Princeton. It's this image of prestige education is education that is affirmatively divorced from ever thinking about getting a job. Right. So how do we tackle that? Okay, so... Um my degree from Brown University <laughs> is... With no, no core curriculum whatsoever at this point. That was not the case, by I the know, way, when I was there. I know, but I just there. talked to someone. But, but, my, but my degree was in philosophy and literature, right? Right. So what, 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 what we said to the Maryland Commission was we see a world that looks like this. It looks to us as though the bonds that used to exist between especially large corporations and their employees are largely broken. And they're, and they're broken both ways. There's much less allegiance by employees to the employer. There's much less yes, allegiance absolutely. by the employer to the employees. This is leading many corporations to reduce the rather meager amounts they were investing yes. in employee training, except in very, very high need companies like Google, right? So, that's creating a world in which more and more people are gig employees. They're, they're serving many masters at the same time, and those masters are changing, and what they want is changing. So we've said to the states, if you ask the companies what they want right now, they're gonna tell you, we want somebody who has a high degree of technical competence that fits today's needs, right? Boom, we, if, if, we have to, if we have to train them once they're there, we're going to look twice unless we're nearly desperate. Right. right? What, we've, what we said to the folks in Maryland was, you have to do, we're now in a point where we have to do two things at the same time. We do have to prepare kids the way they are prepared in Singapore and in Switzerland. That is to say, 
to, to end up coming out of the process with a very high level of skill in a particular narrow area. Right. This is one part of the T. Okay. But the other part is the part you were talking about. Because what these young people are going to find is what I was describing a moment ago. The jobs aren't going to last long. Right. The next one isn't going to look like the one you're going to do now. You may actually be having to work in several different fields at once. You're, what you're going to have to offer an employer is precisely that. That is your flexibility, your, know, your ability to take what you know over here and apply it over there. That is going to take precisely the opposite of the bar of the T I was just describing. It's going to take what you and I experienced at Princeton and Brown. It's going to take a deep, broad education. We're going to have to actually do liberal education, right? I, As the, part of vocational and edu education. My education. general view, to, for what it's worth, is that what we're going to see is that vocational education is going to look more like what we think of as a liberal arts education in a university. And at the same time, the liberal arts education is going to look more like the best vocational education. What we're seeing in Europe now is that more and more kids who went to gymnasium and expected to go to a good university are finishing gymnasium, but before they go to university, they're picking up a credential out of, at a high level out of the vocational education mm -hmm. system. I think that's the future. And I also think that vocational education is not going to be it's not going to be a three-month certificate course in a community college. I think those days, we'll see what well, happens And the to that. one example we can point to, of course, is coding, right? I mean, at this mm -hmm. point, right. Um, right. I think it's extraordinary. At Stanford, it's everybody. But even, everybody. even at, right. for instance, 70% of people take some computer science. Mm -hmm. And even those folks who are never going to do it understand right. they have to know it. But more and more That's kids right. are actually learning to code, which, which is true. I'm mindful of our time, but we've talked about government, we've talked about employers, we've talked about and the, I, you know, the, this tension about what prestige education is, of course, is also makes it very difficult to get the employers onto. Mm -hmm. You, you said it's a workforce board, not an educational board. And indeed, Mary Alice is the only person I've ever met who's worked in the labor department and the ed department. <laughs> That's a very rare, rare very thing. Very few people have done that. Yes. Um, but the other, the other obstacle I think we see, and you've written about in your book, are parents. Mm -hmm. right? And parents, of course, are responding to these general signals about what prestige is. But you wrote, and I think this is so right, that manufacturing work, which if we were looking at it from the point of view of the, you know, the golden age of companies and good jobs, manu unionized manufacturing jobs were very good jobs, but you say the three Ds, that parents see these jobs as dirty, dangerous, and dull, and a fourth, or demeaning. Mm -hmm. And those right. dirty, dangerous, and dull is pretty, pretty demeaning. So how do we, how do we tackle that? And I'll, I'll add, that I was just at the California Future of Work Commission. I talked at the Future of Work Commission, and there was somebody there talking about additive manufacturing, the newest, the way we now talk about 3D manufacturing. And she essentially described a kind of manufacturing that was a very white collar job in traditional categories. So, how, but how do we you know, sort of change that image of what manufacturing is and how parents should think about the larger question of, of vocational edu and educational training. About three days ago, I was on my computer and I was watching um, a, about a five minute video that was put together by Bloomberg. Ah. They, were showing, they were showing a factory in Guangzhou. Oh. Um, they had they had video from the same factory that about, from about five years ago. The pictures from the same factory about five years ago showed you this great big open hall full of people working on various machines, turning out whatever the hell this stuff was. In the second video, it showed the same hall full of robots. Mm -hmm. There was exactly one person in that factory. And then they made the point that you just made. This doesn't, if you look at American farming, it now employs 5% of the people that it employed about 100 years ago. Right. Those, those, those jobs. Those, 
So the Japanese are now turning out tractors that don't need a human driver. They are programmed by the farmer who was sitting in an office in his farm, right? That farmer has to be able to program computers because John Deere is trying to sell them computers that they can't get into, and it's costing them a bloody fortune. And they figure if they can, if they can fix the damn thing themselves, oh. they, they're going to be able to make a pro. <laughs> they, those computers and those machines figure out meter by meter how much water, yep. which fertilizer, how much, which insecticide, how much, what the contours ought to be, right. while the farmer is working the international commodity markets to figure out where he should be investing to hedge his American crops. That often takes a doctorate, right? The same thing is, is happening in our factories, basically. It's not that that one person there is the factory. No, 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 no. Where did all those robots come from? Right. Who programmed them, right? It goes on and on. How do, who fixes them? All those jobs, you're right. We have thought of as, as white-collar jobs. They are white-collar jobs. But they're Not all of them. Jobs. They're, they're manufacturing jobs, yes. But, and this was the point I started with tonight, the people who are coming out of our high schools now are a million miles away from being able to get those jobs. OK. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me end with the final question. Um, so you, you, you've talked about all the different pieces, the joining up, and this, that to me is hugely important to think about uh, you know, how high school joins to community college, to, then mm -hmm. to workforce, uh, and to, right. uh, to continuing education, whether, however we describe it. Um, but you, you actually also talk about skill standards, mm -hmm. and you say right. you, you ha to be able to do this, we have to have different ways of credentialing, yeah. and that means we've got to be That's able, right. if I understand a skill standard, is to be able to say, he, you are able to do this at this standard. So, but talk about what they are, why they're important, how we get there. Okay, let, let's, let's begin with yeah, what they are and, 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 and how you get there. Skill standards in this context simply means the person who is in this program needs to wind up with a certificate that certifies that they know this and can do that. Right. Okay? So the skill standard spells out what the this and the that are. Okay? So why is it important to have this? Because if you have a set of skill standards, it communicates to the student what the student has to know and be able to do to get the job they are after, one. It communicates to the training organization in our country, a community college, what the curriculum needs to be in order to give kids this, a chance of actually acquiring the credential they want. It signals to the employer, if they actually get those credentials because they've met those criteria, that the person applying for the job actually has the skills they want. None of these things are true now. So a community college can go out there and say, Oh, yeah, we have an advisory committee, and I'll go and talk to the members of the advisory committee, and yeah, we, want, we, we meet once a year, and we have a nice time for an hour. The, the community college is putting together a program that its, that it's staff wants to teach. <laughs> That's what happens. I've never heard of such a thing, professors teaching what they want to teach. It never happens. The first country that I went to that had, a, that had a skill standard system that I thought was pretty damn good, a lot better than the German one, by the way, was Denmark. And in Denmark, the equivalent institution to our community colleges is run by the mayor. The people who sit on the board are the heads of the, of the companies hmm. from the principal businesses in town and the heads of the unions of the, of the people who labor there. The skill standards are negotiated at the, at the national level, industry, labor, governments managing the process. Unlike Germany, which set a skill standard and then left it alone for eight to 10 years, they had a system set up so that at the local level, what I'm just describing, the community college level, if the community college employers, mayor, labor, came to them and said, we are now involved in a new industry that has these needs, we need an exception to the rules because this is going to make us more competitive. If they could make that argument stick, they would not only allow them to do that, they would then and there consider changing the national skill standard, not waiting in eight to 10 years. So 
what I've said to you, I think, are two important things. One is who is running the show. Yep. Our community colleges are basically run by the educators. This is the comparable institutions in these other countries. It's much more complicated than that. In, in Singapore, they are run by the vocational educators, but the people who have been planted in the key positions are most of them from the Economic Development Board. All right. So. Mark Tucker, thank you. I will tell everybody, since I, I have a blurb on the back of the book, uh, it is an excellent book. And it really, it, it both gives you wonderful knowledge around the world, but it does actually convince you in the end that there is no special magic in Germany or Singapore or Switzerland right. that the United States can't do. And we frankly need that right. kind of reminding. So I urge you to read the book. And I thank you for kicking off this conversation. I thank you for your You're support. Welcome. Thank you very much.